So hopefully I'll be able to convince you at the end of the talk as to why we wrote a report with such a boring title on it. <coughs> um, but one of the really exciting things, reasons for being here that we're keen on is, is the fact that if you look in here, there's not much agroecology, there's not much water, there's not much resilience. And actually, the things like social science and, and the economics of things are really issues that we're missing and this is why it's really great to be able to collaborate with Miguel and Katarina and, and uh, hopefully with, with other partners of you as well. So I want to talk about a, a couple of things today. Um, the first is really trying to look into, I'm going to talk about the definition of biological things, so we're going to sidestep that. So we're going to go and think about what the impact is and how you go about measuring the impact and how this is varied by the law. Um, around the world, and then why we're really trying to move towards much more standardised systems of, of recording these sorts of things, not just in South Africa but, but globally. And I'll go through a few of the systems that we're doing, going to, to look at on that. The other main theme, as I mentioned already, is I'm an ecologist, and a lot of the people who've been working on these issues are ecologists or biologists or geneticists or. And but the move really is, as with many global change drivers, are we realizing that these are um, issues that span all sectors of society, um, clearly not just a biodiversity issue. And the, the question is, how do we best uh, go about collaboration in, in those contexts? So first of all, the reason why we worry about it is impact. Now I'm sure quite a few of you know what a hyacinth. Um, and this is just an example of an irrigation uh, channel in China. Uh, they're growing some it looks like maize over there. Um, and this channel would have been clear. But now it's covered in a plant from Brazil. And water hyacinths can grow up to can grow up to sort of 60 kilograms fresh weight per meter square. So I, I put on a little bit of weight, but it's almost the equivalent of me being every meter squared across that. So that's quite a substantial change. And if you think of people who are wanting to use that system, they obviously can't. There's an additional problems in terms of that habitat for, for mosquitoes, for, for snails, uh, in terms of the water quality, it's, it's dropping up the, the, the water flow. And this is actually a relatively minor case of talking about. If we're thinking on a much grander scale, much larger scale, this is a satellite image of Lake Victoria. This, I think this is the wind belt. I needed to check on that. And if you look at the scale down there, the fuzzy scale about 20 kilometers, um, it's got these lovely pink clouds, but I think they just colored it. It should, should be colored green, it's probably more appropriate. But you're talking about areas of a lake that are now covered in kilometers squared of plant. Previously, it was open water. That's a massive change to the system, and that's the, the sorts of impacts we've been seeing for biological invasions. But obviously, we want to pin this down. But what does this actually mean? And there's surprisingly few studies that have actually been able to pin down exactly you know, what's the actual cost of this. One study that did from quite a while ago um, is from uh, Benin or Benin, um, and it uh, was a survey of um, people uh, using traditionally and positive methods. Um, in a series of villages in the, the south of Benin. Uh, and they were looking at the yearly income of a population of about 200,000 people, and that was reduced by something in the order of 84 uh, million US dollars. Um, but perhaps more importantly, this, this is rather than the gross economic thing, is what that actually means to the people who are living there. So when you're looking at the, the negative Im impacts in terms of the response to the survey, you can't actually get a canoe through those areas anymore if you look at the thing in China. You can't it's stopping all transport. And there's particular cases in back in New Guinea where um, on the Sepik River, people cannot get to hospital um, because they can't use that, what used to be the life lifeline of those areas. So sort of fishing nets becomes a bit difficult, health is affected through the diseases, fish stocks are reduced, um, and particularly of particular importance here is actually the the um, amount of protein that um, um, children and uh, families are eating, you see a significant reduction in the amount of protein available to those communities. 
I'm not quite sure what the normal the normal jazz mode means. I think she's in good enough, so I don't know. Sorry? Oh is it? Oh it's oh it's okay. okay. So it's not French, uh, but it's um, and then tied actually to market. Of course there are some positives. Um, not very much in this case. <laughs> you can potentially pick it up, chuck it on the on your crops, and there might be some fertilizer effect. But it is very important in these sorts of cases to look at both the negatives and the positives if you're going to be making a decision. One thing that is has repeatedly come up in water hyacinth is this idea that if you have a body of water hyacinth, it's going to lose a lot of water. Then the level of evapotranspiration from that body part in the plants is different from what it would be from an open water body. Um, and you, you end up with the um, figures of, of, and then you end up with the, the, the cost of this is massive. But actually, what, what happens, um, as you can see here, there's a really massive clothesline effect. So rather than, so all that's doing, and if you're measuring evapotranspiration in that system, it's a simple area, you've massively increased the amount of air. Whereas actually, if you think of that lake in the, the, the channel in China, it was basically the same area, if you think of the barrier layer between the, the, the plants and the amount of water evapotranspiration goes along. And sure enough, if you look at evapotranspiration, the loss of water from those bodies, as you get the air of the container from the experiment going on, that's, you see a clear decline. Um, actually, I'm very keen if anybody's uh, good at physics and could work out the, the, the physics of this, exactly what sort of relationship you would expect between these sorts of things, uh, because clearly it's a, it's a mechanical process. But this gives us sort of an example where people are saying, you know, the amount of water is lost, but that's actually an artifact here. That's not to say all oh, these other effects are not real, but we have to be very careful sometimes when people come along and say that they are impacts, but they are actually not there at all. So what, what, what did we do with um, water hazard? What happened with that? You can go in and harvest it. You can get a, a machine to, to, to dig it out. Um, but it grows very quickly, so it's, it's actually very happy. You just end up with lots of material that's very difficult to move around. You could spray it, and it would decompose on site. But obviously the herbicides are massively expensive. But this really is the poster child for, for classical biological control, where um, they're introducing a weevil from its native range in Brazil that feeds uh, mainly on the leaves or the petioles um, and lays eggs. And the real damage comes when the, the larvae are mining in these petioles and that's reducing the buoyancy um, and causing significant damage in the rootstock. And then um, you see um, the uh, uh, pupate in the, the roots. So actually the whole life cycle is wrapped up in the, in the water has been quite tightly wrapped up. And this has been enormously successful. So in the same system in Benin, we're looking at the percentage cover of water hyacinths over, so this is over about eight years, and you can see gradually over time you're moving the situation from completely covered by water hyacinths to something, a system that's much more like this. Um, and you, here you can obviously start moving your, your canoe around and you can start fishing again. And if you look at the benefit cost ratio, you get these very large uh, benefit cost ratio of 124 to 1. And you get similar sort of cost ratios when you look at biological control if it is successful in other systems. Um, thinking of, of what happened in Lake Victoria, there was again a massive uh, reduction in the level of water ice and subsidy. Basically, isn't the problem anymore. Um, so these arrows are the, the, the times when the, the weevils were released. There was some debate, and the reason we wrote this short paper was that there was an El Nino effect, and people were saying, "Well, it's just uh, it's just cloudy weather. That's the reason the water hasn't disappeared," um, which seemed to us a little bit strange. But sure enough, there, there does seem to be a bit of a dip immediately after it being cloudy. Um, but the long-term sustained. Um, reduction in water mass was due to the introduction of uh, a biological control agent to the system. So going on to some of the impacts in, in South Africa um, on water, and I don't know if many people here have heard about the, the crisis in Cape Town, the, the water crisis. 
and they had this wonderful campaign, a very evocative concept of day zero, the day at which you run out of water. Now, it's, it's got a sort of ring of Hollywood about it, but it really resonated with everybody. Suddenly, you had this vision, right, I'm going to have to get um, uh, get your bucket and go to a tank that comes around and get a bucket of water every day. Um, and it's made it's led to serious um, change in the way in which people are reacting and interacting with water in Cape Town. So I, I think it's actually been quite a good... Um, it, ideally, we wouldn't have got into the situation in the first place, but now you can see people are putting up uh, uh, water tanks to collect rainwater. They're, they're moving from uh, very water-intensive gardens to, to, to dry gardens and things like that. And one of the things that was very, very good about this was this sort of information that became available. So how many people here, how much water is in the dams in Coventry? Does anybody know how full those dams are? I think the water comes from Wales. Does it come from Wales? Okay. <laughs> 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 but how, how full are the dams in Wales then? Are, are they 100%? Are they 10%? 20%? Pretty full. It's <laughs> pretty full. <laughs> you have to keep it to me. But they won't be able to tell me. As of Monday, the dams were 81.7% full. Um, that's the sort of level at which the engagement has, has come on. Um, and then this is at the end of, end of uh, the rainy season. So actually 81.7, that's pretty good. I mean, ideally we should be 100% coming to the end of the rainy season because we've got a long, dry summer to come. But going back a couple of years, at the end of the summer, our dams were about 37.6% full. Mm -hmm. And then, and you can see the weekly dam shape doesn't change. And then in May of that year, they were 20% full. Now, I, I don't know much about dams, but apparently you certainly can't use the last 10%, uh, maybe not the last 13, 14%. So we got very close to running out of, of water in Cape We managed to avert it, but not entirely. Uh, but, you know. So what's this got to do with biological invasions? Well, I talked about that evapotranspiration of the floating aquatic vegetation. But if you think of a pine tree, and you think of the reason why that evapotranspiration was wrong for the water hyacinth, it's all it's a closed line effect. Those pine trees work exactly in the same way as the water hyacinth. Rather than having back bare earth, you've got this massive closed line standing up into the, into the place. They've done the hydrological experiments. So at a, at a large scale, there, there might be some, some place in the world where, where having forest helps the, 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 the flow of water, but certainly in these systems, if you convert what is shrubland into a forest, you're going to see dramatically redu reduced amounts of water. It certainly wasn't the main, I should always stress, it wasn't the major cause of this, but even if it was 5 or 10% <coughs> contributing to this, the amount of money that that 5 to 10% represents um, about preventing that. So when you get to 5 10% of the, the water here, you're talking another month or two months worth of water. And it's a relatively cost-effective thing to go into those um, catchments and clear the pines, clear the eucalypts. Um, sorry, I just put some data up here that looks at, you can see in the very much annual cycle, rainy season, dry season, rainy season, dry season. Um, and it had been going down for three drought years. Um, it has been improving. Uh, the, the, we're better in 2019 than we were in 2018. Um, but it's not quite back up there yet. Um, we, we, we will have to accept the fact that there's going to be lower rainfall going forward. But this was um, a program on controlling invasive trees around South Africa. Uh, there was a Working for Water program that was established um, in the early 90s by 19. Um, <coughs> well, the arguments were made in the, the, the early 90s, so about 90. Um, I'm on the camera, I should get this right. I better not say a date just in case I get it wrong. But in the 90s, they established the Working for Water program that was about this simple concept. And this was the sort of concept that sold it to the policy makers. You have the same amount of rainfall, 1,200 millimetres. You have a light infestation, and you've got 40% uh, loss of water, and the cost of clearing is 120 rand. 
you get slightly more, you've got 25%, and then the cost of clearing is now 1,000, it's gone up tenfold. And you see a very dense infestations, you're seeing a lot, lot less water. This item was bought at the time, and there was a lot of money that was being put into these sorts of schemes. As you can imagine, there's been a, there's been a major resurgence in, in these sorts of schemes now, and, and there were some really exciting developments about uh, trying to clear these areas from invasive trees. So these are some estimates from our reports uh, based on the, some published literature. The combined impacts of invasive alien plants and surface water runoff off, run off for estimates would be about 1,500 1, to 2,500 million meter, cubic meters per year. The Cape Town sort of catchment here is actually quite small. Um, and the storage is, is about 900 million cubic meters. So, but it gives you the sorts of indications that we're dealing with an issue simply due to the invasive alien vegetation that makes a difference. <coughs> I, I haven't provided some stats here, but um, for those of you who have really been following the South African situation, you might have seen there were some um, bad fires along the, the, the garden routes in the, the Niger area. Um, and again, these are, these are caused by pines, the particular pines, eucalypts and Australia's, and we've been moving our um, most of South Africa's are fire dominated ecosystems, but we've been moving those to a very different types of fires. The sorts of fires you hear about in Australia, where you see <coughs> large lots of property and life. The moment we are, we are letting um, pine trees or eucalypts, it's, it's both the plantations and the things out in the wild, the moment you're moving those ecosystems over to things with much higher fuel loads, much greater flammability, you're seeing a much uh, greater. Um, Greater fires, greater loss due to those fires. Of course, working for the, the National Biodiversity Institute, one of our, our, our chief worries is about uh, biodiversity. And in South Africa, <coughs> we have several um, biodiversity hotspots. Um, the Cape Flo uh, Flores Kingdom is, is one particular one of them, and this is just a, a one picture of many you could take of gorgeous landscapes you can go. It really is a dream um, for a botanist. And what you're seeing is, for, for various sort of eco ecological, eco-evolutionary reasons, you bring in Australian uh, acacias, and this sort of landscape gets converted into this sort of landscape. A monoculture from a nitrogen fixing, uh, tree. And at the moment, the, the, our estimate is that biological invasions are counting for about a quarter of the reductions in South African biodiversity seen to date, and that can, that, that can clearly rise in time. I thought I'd just throw in a UK example, and this is based on we were at a meeting the ecology and management of alien plant invasions over in Prague in Southern Katarina last week. Um, and there's an interesting case um, that was, uh, people know Max Wade, perhaps, which a lot. How many people here have, have got Japanese botweed in the garden or close by there in the garden? Okay. Do you like it? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the estimate of the total annual cost of the British economy is about 166 million pounds. That seems a lot, but guess what it is. And there's a stat that um, uh, it's quite quite funny listening to that way. The stat that two two million pounds was spent to around the Japanese not meet on one hectare, one two hectare development site. What what sort of gets lost a little bit is that two hectare development site was actually the, the London Stadium for the Olympics. So you you are kind of dealing with a, a bit of a different situation there. But very quickly you can see how basic statistics and basic things end up um, being overblown in some cases and it is a real pain as a plant but they actually went and, and nobody had done this surprisingly for how long you 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 you've had japanese not been in the country and how much is being spent on controlling it by private individuals by government people hadn't really looked in, and evaluated the damage under, under those circumstances and what they found was actually there's no significant damage to built structures there's lots of damage in terms of flood prevention, lots of damage in terms of biodiversity, 
But when you when you start looking at these sorts of cases, there's there's not very good evidence that it's actually ruining houses. There's some evidence that um, you know it, it might be similar to other things, like the bud layers or trees coming in. But the damage is actually similar to, to, to those sorts of cases. So it's it, it's looking at the counterfactual here. Um, and the, what had been had been perceived was you had uh, control of all the things from seven meters from your infestation. And they sort of looked at that and realized actually it should be about two and a half meters. Uh, probably three meters if you want to be safe. Um, so people have been implementing things that haven't actually been based on anything and uh, come it's, it's <coughs> got their own lives on these statistics. And this is the, the sort of examples where what we're really wanting to move to is this much more standardized system of measuring impact. So we need the raw data, we need the raw studies, but we need to have that system in, in when looking at biological relations and other global change drivers. But we need to have these things to be able to look at that are applicable across taxonomic groups, include all the different impact mechanisms that are based on the organizational level in the recipient community, and ideally they were adopted by internationally and by in global efforts. So that we so that you, you look at some of the really bad impacts of Japanese work, not we, they don't get mu mu uh, messed around with impacts which are not so bad, or there's less evidence to do that. And this is Katrina, I don't know if or Jan, I don't know if we've spoken to spoken about the environmental impact classification of alien tax scheme. But this is really an initiative to have a global standard on how we go about defining impact uh, for um, alien species and how um, what the mechanisms are for each of that and how you relate the mechanisms to what the actual evidence is. So this is based on um, there's a, a link there, this is based on um, um, published evidence, so it's, it's moving away from that sort of expert opinion approach. Um, and you can see, for those of you who are working in conservation, it's very closely related to the, to the red list sort of scheme. You have invasions in a particular country, um, they need to be evaluated, and there needs to be some alien populations, and then there's, by the very fact of being alien, you're having some sort of impact. It might be as uh, as trivial as saying you're adding a species to the species richness, that's an impact, but it's of minimal concern. Um, but moving up, you might be having, you might be reducing, having impacts on other individuals of the species, or you might be reducing uh, populations of another species. And when you get up to the massive level of impact, so real uh, logarithmic scale, you're talking about species that are ending up resulting in irreversible changes to a system. So extinctions would be a classic example in those sorts of cases. But in many cases, if you think back to those Australian acacias invading the fine moss, they're really changing the nutrient dynamics of those systems. In some cases, the native plant that's kind of can come back, but if they've changed the physical nature of that ecosystem enough, restorations would be very difficult. As you notice, I haven't really talked much about socio-economic issues here. So we've tried to also look at a, a, a developed scheme to look at socioeconomic impacts. Um, and here, while conceptually we're using the same scale from minimal concern to massive, we did it, we needed a different currency. And we were very keen to avoid using a traditional monetary currency and trying to think of actually what is it that's, that what people are impacted by. And the unit that we've, we've been proposing is that about the activities that people do? Has there been a change in what people actually do? So if you look at um, if you look at what people do, that's based on what they can potentially do, and then what they actually end up doing, the realised activities. And an alien taxon can come in and it can change what can potentially be done, you know, that the capability set, but it can also change um, what people choose to do. So in this sort of case, the, the fluke and case, the impact might not actually be in structural damage compared to, to other plants, but it is affecting the, the sale of houses in particular areas. And so you might not tie that effect to, um, to, a, to a real mechanism, but that is a real effect. People's house prices have, have been affected. So that's the sort of 
example of where it's affecting those, the, the re, re, it's changing the activities, even though, well, in this case, it's changing the, 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 the value of the activity rather than removing the activity altogether. Um, so examples can be, um, uh, so invasive wasps come, are, are a problem in New Zealand, a problem uh, increasingly in South Africa, and they mean that certain people can't go to uh, have a picnic in certain areas anymore. Um, so they, they've lost that um, activity altogether. In some cases, they could go and you know, there'd be a relatively minor amount of stains, but you know, they've chosen that in that case, is that, that um, um, picnic area or wine farm is, is happening. So that's just some, some indication of where we're trying to go to, to, to get some idea of the, the impact. One thing I, I should perhaps say in both these schemes, and something that's still ongoing in the community, is trying to also measure the positives. These are only based on the negatives. That's a starting point to say what are the negative impacts. But there's two other parts of that problem. What are the positive impacts of, of the data species in present? Um, and then clearly, you know, what, what are the, well, so there's an additional part of that. One of the points is what's a counterfactual? What would happen if that alien species was not? How can you compare the relative uh, benefits or the relative things? And then also, what can you do about it? Uh, which is getting much more into the risk analysis and side of things. So moving from those sorts of schemes, I'm, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, what we're doing in South Africa, about trying to monitor and report on, on these issues. Um, and the rationale for, for this really comes, before, comes from the, our experience with the work of a water program in many cases. Um, really, they were setting goals and going out and managing things without a clear idea of, of, what they were, of why they were doing that or how they were going to improve what they were doing. Um, and ideally, there should be this sort of flow from basic research to assessing the implications and formulating policy and setting goals and implementing management measures, and then some monitoring and evaluation and feedback loops at various points. One thing and one of the reasons I'm we're very keen to work with Jana and Katarina is that um, socioeconomic research didn't fit, fit into our original um, figure and doesn't fit into this report, but it's, it's obviously a massive gap that we need to, to solve the future. The reality of the situation is they're, they're all poorly connected. You have the research going on, they're very happy to publish a paper, um, and then on the other side, someone's going along and managing something, and, um, and then somewhere else, someone's setting the goals, and, and none of it actually being so. A sort of naive view, but perhaps one view is, is that a status report provides some method for, for linking these things together. So that was the that's so how we tried to sell it to ourselves. It was written into regulation, so we had to do it anyway, so we tried to come up with some reason as to why we were doing what we were doing. And as part of that status report, we developed some indicators to try and get an idea that we can track these things over the time. This, and eventually, we would hope to get to that sort of dashboard situation. You've got the water in Cape Town. That sort of situation where you can engage with them. So this is the report. Um, it's available free to download. It's, uh, it's rather long URL, but uh, it's on my email. So if, I, if you send me an email, I'll just reply with uh, my email. Be there. And there's lots of, uh, I should, should have a caution. There's lots of errors in this, but we're due to um, update it every two years. So we're busy doing the, the next, next update at the moment. Um, and part of the next report is really to, to filter out those errors we've got this first. But just to, to give you an idea of conceptually what we're doing in this report, this is a picture from South Africa. You've got a bit of native vegetation there, and then you've got all these pine trees invading uh, from these pine plantations in the background. And there's a few things, as a, as a, as a manager, there's a few things you want to know about this. The first thing, you obviously want to know how the pine has got there. How did they, how were they brought in? Well, obviously in this case it's forest trees. You obviously want to know what species it is, because there might be species specific difference, differences between that. Um, and then also you want to know something about the whole area where the events happen. What's 
sort of vegetation do we have? Um, you know, what, 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 what are the impacts in terms of the, the water uh, available? Is there a, a town down, uh, there are several towns down this valley. How are they getting impacted in terms of the loss of water as a result of all the invasions you see in this area? But we also, as a manager, we also want to know um, what can we do about it? How much money is being spent trying to control all these pines running up the mountain? And then how much effort is spent, um, how, how has whatever we're doing, how has that impacted the, the extent of the, the pines going up the, the mountains or the, the, the outputs? And then ultimately we want to know what the outcomes are. Are we, as a result of that control, is it effective? Are we seeing more water in that dam at the bottom of the catchment? So this is the, the broad um, conceptual model we had. We give a pathway species and sites, and then interventions in terms of inputs, outputs, and outcomes. So that provided the structure for our, our report, and we developed a series of indicators with those indicators linked to things like uh, the ICAT assessment and the CCAT assessment. Um, and we published this, this paper last <coughs> year. I'm not going to go into the details of that, I'll just pick out a few, few results to give you the kinds of, of things that we're talking about here. So for instance, the number and status of alien species. Um, <coughs> in the past 15 years, you see the amount of naturalized plant species has increased from about 600 uh, to about 773, so there's been a significant increase in those numbers. Um, if you look at the impact of avian species, we, didn't, we don't have the formal ICAT assessment yet, um, but you're certainly seeing pines in the fine boss, uh, wattles in mesic areas, and particularly chrysopus in, in arid areas that are causing uh, the major problems. And thinking at a high level, um, the rate of introduction of new unregulated species in South Africa, we're estimating is around about seven a year. A uh, number of invasive species that have major impacts, around about 100 species, those are the ones we need to concentrate on. The extent of South Africa that suffers major impacts from invasions is reasonably small at the moment, 1.4%. Depends how we calculate it, obviously, but um, that can grow significantly. Um, and our estimate of the level of success in managing invasions, um, so that's based on which invasions should we manage. Uh, which invasions are actually being managed, and are we seeing a reduction in, in, the, in the thing? So, for pathway sites and area, um, pathway species sites, we came to the rather depressing figure of 5.5%. Um, now, there's a lot you, that can be done to improve this indicator. We hope that um, the relatively simple measures are about actually reporting on what's done as a first step. That would be the first way to improve it. And that on itself would be very useful to know actually what has been been done. Um, but this level of success we, we suspect is something that we are, um, we haven't tried it elsewhere in the world. Um, we're very curious to see whether this actually will give the right incentives um, to people to see what, um, to improve how we go about it and actually focus on the things that, that, that matter. <coughs> so a summary for, for policy makers. In South Africa, unlike um, Australia or other places, plants are the most diverse, widespread, and damaging invaders. Um, something that I, I think I will, um, given the time, I'm not going to really talk about is that there's this major invasion debt. So the status report is very much about what we've currently got, um, but thinking of the cases of the number of species in horticulture, in gardens, or in um, use around the country. There's a significant number of those which will become invasive in the future, and ones which are already spread around the country are going to spread further. Initial estimates, and, and we really do need uh, better collaboration with economists, estimates are we're spending about 1.5 billion rand a year on these issues, and that's particularly through the Department of Environmental Affairs, with the, as well as the Department of Environmental Environment. Fisheries and forestry. Okay. That's why you don't want to build a camera for some of these things. <laughs> you start getting the government departments wrong that fund you, you get in deep trouble. So sorry about that. Um, and the cost is about six and a half um, billion rand per year. So the cost in many of these cases is surprising. The Barnum's Group of Control Plants has been a major success. 
um, and one of the features is really that project level planning is one of the easiest way to, to sort of improve things. So I think given the time, I'm, I'm going to skip over um, this bit about proactive management. Um, this is something we, we, we've been really trying to focus on on the next in, in a wave of invaders, and we'd be very happy to chat to any of you. But if you're very, if you've got didactic memory, just focus now, and then you can see all the slides and will be brilliant. So just go quick. Oh, well, I can show you this one. Um, but this is just the invasion curve, and it's what again, it's a communication mm -hmm. device, but it's quite the argument for um, proactive management. These economic returns are a thumb side, but they probably hold true in many cases. The return on investment by preventions, say one in a hundred, and eradication, meaning complete removal from an air where it's unlikely to reinvade, it's about one in 25, containment, one in, one in five to 10, and asset based protection, you're basically just getting a return on this. Okay, you can close your eyes now, I'll tell you when it's a room. Mm -hmm. Zip through these slides as if they didn't exist. Uh, well, there's a book if you want to have a book. You will open your eyes and buy my book. <laughs> um, and then I just want to end with a sort of open invitation to, to come work with us in South Africa. We need people to. You can see that a lot of this is naive ecologists doing the work, and we need, um, we need help. Just a couple of bits on the institutions that I. So I'm an associate of the Centre for Invasion Biology. It's uh, it's funded by the government and it's it's got its base at Stellenbosch University, but it's got a, a distributed model. So there's people at uh, all the universities and the institutions around the country, uh, but it, it serves as a sort of focal point for, for moving things on on this issue. Um, there were initially about five or six centres of excellence in South Africa. There was things on. Uh, on uh, metals, there was a, a set of experts on uh, tuberculosis and those sorts. So, a wide range of issues. Been around for about 15 years, 1,745 papers, there's journal special issues and books, there's 200 odd um, graduates, um, quite a number of postdocs trying to input into policy. Um, and I might just say something about the Inver Valley Outreach Project, which was really quite exciting. Um, that they're doing there. Um, but before that, this is this is a, a map of, of the CIB and how it's interacted with people around the world. And it's, you can't really see the details in South Africa, but we feel that we really have had a, a bit of a, a global influence on the, the field of invasion science. So this, this isn't a transport network, this is co authoring publications. We didn't actually have to fly to meet people, we just had to write them an email and see. Of course, you probably do fly a bit, a bit too much, but, um, but yeah. I don't know if you're going to fly a bit. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> so, this is Imbavani. It's um, Imbavani means uh, ants in Kolaza. Um And it's about it's a project where they're, they're going into, um, into um, schools uh, in the Cape Town area and a wee bit beyond as well. Um, Providing them with microscopes and providing them with the practicals um, to do monitoring of, of ant diversity in these systems. So it actually ends up being a great data set for looking at uh, where the ants are and things like imagine Argentine ants, there's a bit of an invasion component to that as well. Um, so there's the website. There you can have a look at um, really fantastic uh, projects. It's really inspiring by a lot of people. In terms of the South African National Biodiversity Institute, um, probably the closest in, in, in Britain would be something like uh, um, Kew. Uh, but there isn't really a, a, an analogue here. But we are sitting just out, just, we've got a mental organisation, but just sitting outside those sort of um, uh, departments. And we, we're, we're doing work on the foundations of biodiversity, so uh, providing the links to all the collections, um, and the taxonomy, inventory, and maps. We're building biodiversity knowledge with the assessments, uh, status, trends, monitoring, and monitoring. Then trying to think how best to get that science into action. So it's, in many ways, it's a bridging institution uh, about information planning, policy advice, models, models and tools. 
Um, and then we have the gardens and now a, a zoo as well, um, and obviously human capital development to provide that foundation. And we're trying to ultimately influence um, how people uh, see biodiversity and how they benefit from biodiversity in South Africa. Very much about human well-being, improved service delivery, and uh, job creation. And that's our, our website down the bottom. Um, specifically within this, I'm working in the biological innovations directory. Already talked a little bit about status reports, um, and then we're also doing other functions like looking at the risk analysis, providing the evidence behind um, why things should be listed or, or regulated or not. And as for those of you who can read incredibly quickly, you will have seen all of that our work on the commercial response as well. Just a few points to other things. We've got a book that's coming out on the biological innovations of South Africa, should be out. We're trying to get it out this year, but they've got something with a 2020 date on it, so it doesn't look like it's going to make it this year. Um, but that's coming out quite soon. And here's a few websites in there. Thank you very much. <laughs>